uh, about Alabama, do you remember any particular local uh, history or tales or feelings that you had about the place? I lecture a lot, and people always ask me, when did I get interested in uh, foraging and that sort of thing? Well, I was going to get to that, yes. Well, there on 2nd Avenue South, where my grandmother lived in, in Birmingham, across the street there was a lonely old man, perhaps 80 years old, who had a family, but you know, he just wasn't part of the family, and he had a bunch of rabbits. And I think the rabbits and I were his best friends. He would take me up on the mountain side. It was a mountain to me then, but there's some pretty big hills out near East Lake Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And he taught me the watercress and the chestnut, and he had a great love for the for the forest. And I think I was hooked by the time I was five, thanks to old Mr. Brooks across the street. That young? That young. Mm -hmm. Were any uh, body else in your family no. besides yourself particularly well, I have a interested? Well educated family. My older brother has a master's degree in French and he teaches French in North Carolina and my younger brother has a PhD in psychology and he teaches psychology in North Carolina but uh, my younger brother poor poor man has said well I'm allergic to everything so I can't go outdoors so he says you're lucky Jim and I quite agree I, love, I would hate to be allergic to the great outdoors yes so would I what do you remember uh, particularly about school? Because you must have started school in Alabama. Uh, I started school Alabama. in Birmingham, and my mother was a real pusher. And when we finally moved to North Carolina, she juggled the papers such that I, I skipped a grade and uh, managed to stay with a class that I was a year younger than. That has its advantages and disadvantages. Yes. But uh, I remember very little about the Birmingham schooling. By the time the whole family moved to North Carolina, the three boys in the rumble seat of a very broken down car, uh, things were more impressionable. And I do remember the Durham schools. And then after a year or two in Durham, North Carolina, we moved to Raleigh, North Carolina, where I got into the Scouts. And there the outdoor business uh, got real active. And even some of my teachers realized that I was cooked on botany and biology, and so they catered to my interest there. Go to kindergarten. I, as a matter of fact, few people believe this, but my mother still insists it's true. I do remember delivering magazines to a college that was about three or four blocks from my house, and even before school, before the age of school, I was trading those guys magazines to play some of their country music. <laughs> so I had the love for the music and the love for, for the biology before I got to grade, uh, grade school. And in, in North Carolina, you were then in what, third grade? Yeah. And the town there, were that you in town? Durham, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And there's a little interlude there I'd like to share with you. My mother realized that there was a James B. Duke, no relation, mm -hmm. uh, who had founded the Duke Gardens there at Duke University. And then she cajoled me into setting up our own little Duke Gardens there in, Durham, <laughs> in our first home of any consequence. And she managed to get me a job at this young age, just watering in a, in a greenhouse, and they parted with plants. So we had our mini Duke Gardens uh, there close to Women's College in, in Durham. Your mother must have been a remarkable woman. She was. She uh, had a great love for the outdoors. My father was strictly a vegetable man, and my mother was strictly a flower person. But I got a little of both. Between the two of them. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that she uh, juggled a few papers and got you into a, a class ahead of where you were. Yeah. Um, she had a lot of influence in your life. I would say that uh, she did indeed. Unfortunately, she had a problem, a mental problem that took, took her from me for about 20 years, and now thanks to lithium, uh, she's a perfect person again, and I wish I could remember the things about my past that she can. She Maybe she should be here too. Oh, she <laughs> should. She could straighten me out on the <laughs> faux pas I'm making, I'm sure. She remembers many, many details about many, many things, and my friend's names who I've long forgotten. That's wonderful. Does she live nearby? She's in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. I hope that you'll show her the tape when you get through. Uh, I will. We get through I'll with be it. Going down to play the guitar for her 93rd birthday, uh, October 8th. 93. Yeah, and her mother lived to be almost 101. 
And I have another poem in there about my grandmother. I, I keep arguing with people that sassafras is not really as dangerous as the real beer, even though it's been outlawed. And I say that my 101-year-old grandmother didn't know that sassafras was carcinogenic. And somebody should have told her she might have lived longer. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> her last four years were not the most active, but until she was 96, she was very agile and very accumulative. Well, you've got a lot of years ahead of you in your career also. Your father is no longer alive? No, he's, he's deceased. Uh, he died of cancer, and two of his brothers died of cancer, both at age 65. And you might have heard rumors that I might be retiring soon, but sometimes it looks as though retiring might, might have lethal consequences. Well, I think it does for some people. This is a, a story that's important to me, and I think to some of your listeners as well. Both my father and the two brothers who died of cancer had graduated from the rural high-fiber diet to the meat and potato diet of the newly affluent. And I really think that their, their cancers of the colon were due to this change in diet. I think they would have lived many more years had they not achieved this, this level of affluence. I can't prove that, but I'm what's called a high-fiber nut, trying to avoid the same chain of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Let's see, I'll be 60 in April. I got five more years. So yeah, get, get my brand flex in. <laughs> Thank you for telling us that story. It is important to hear that. As far as uh, growing up in um, Durham, North Carolina, it was within the city limits that you were living. It was within the city limits. But you limits. had a garden. I had a small flower garden. A flower garden. My mother, which she spoke of as a mini Duke garden. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you raise herbs? Recollection. I only remember the old ornamental verbena. It, for some reason, my mother was very fond of verbena, and that's where we went overboard. And we were only in Durham a year or two, and then we moved to Raleigh. And there again, my father had the vegetable garden, and I would bring in wildflowers, lady slippers from the wild. I had gotten to learn already the, the names of many of the wildflowers. And I think my mother treasured more than anything a lady slipper I brought. Oh, about three miles away where I used to go squirrel hunting. Already in grade school, I was squirrel hunting. But in retrospect, I really didn't want to kill a squirrel. I just wanted to be out in the forest in fall. Gave you an excuse. Right, yeah. And I, I, I quit shooting the squirrels, but I kept going to the woods. <laughs> did you take your gun? No, I left the gun at home. Uh, did, you, did you have other wild game besides squirrels? Uh, in those early years, I was even trapping, which was even more disconcerting than, than, than shooting the squirrels. I had a trap line and I would occasionally get a, a muskrat. And I discontinued that at quite an early age too. But it gave me an excuse to run around and follow the same path. Same path, the woods. yes. What do you remember about uh, the kinds of clothes you were wearing and the houses you were living in? Anything particular? Knickers struck me as something my mother forced onto me <laughs> through, yes. through grade school. and I. It hadn't dawned on me until you asked that question. Uh, I have always liked being barefooted, and I, even today when I go home, I'll end up in short pants and bare, bare feet, and that's hereditary. My daughter has the same attributes. But that's all that I remember about clothes. Those knickers certainly itched yes. around the, the yeah. knee level. Oh, we can suggest that you uh, take your jacket off and be a little more comfortable, or take your shoes off or no, something. <laughs> Susan, I will think I will take, take your jacket off. Sure. Fine. You mentioned the um, the knickers. Do you remember anything particular as far as as religious training or discipline that you wanted to? Uh, uh, reminisce with us yes, about? Yes, my, my mother sort of encouraged me to go to to the Baptist church nearby. As a matter of fact, I even went to some some revival tents nearby and even played guitar there a time or two a little bit later in life. But my first, uh, I think I was 13 when I was baptized, but it was very short thereafter I started contemplating infinity and, and where did God come from and sort of felt like I experienced a huge loss when I, when I lost my belief. But for a while, I was very fr 
firm and devout Baptist and was even lecturing to them about ministry. I remember talking about missionaries in Brazil and I was working with what was called the Royal Ambassadors. And the Royal Ambassadors? Yeah, RAs as I recall. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that's what it stands for. This is a Baptist group? Yeah. And I, was, I was very active for a while until that, that infinity jumped on me. It does do that, it does but you were that. fairly young to have it jump, it seems like. Yeah, it jumped quite young. But uh, I think I replaced the infinity with the Greenie. The Greenie is, is my friend. I like that. 